Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal on this December 13th, 2016 day in our calendar. I'm your host, Greg Anthony. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. You can listen to my show every evening from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Pacific Time, Monday through Friday. They also play the show at 11 a.m., and if you can't get it there, you know where to go. Go to my longstanding website at ARCTICBEACON.com. ArcticBeacon.com, and you can get shows and stories and everything going back over a decade regarding what I call the Vatican-led New World Order, all its tentacles, and all its ramifications. And let's get to the point. It's going to lead to a one-world government, a one-world order. The question only is when. Now, i got two major subjects today I want to speak about. First, I want to talk about the petition to uh, uh, get Tony Alamo out of prison. And we're, I started a website, and I want to talk a little bit about that and uh, how Christians are being persecuted in, in this country. And then secondly, I want to go back to an old interview I did with a guy by the name of Jim Rothstein. He was a police detective in New York City. And his uh, role was to uh, uncover where were these kids going to, slave trafficking, pedophilia. And so years ago, I went back to the source. Why not talk to the people really investigating this? And I'm not talking about going to your congressman or going to your local pastor or going to anyone in those organizations. I'm talking about the the boots on the ground, the, the cops on the ground, the detectives who wanted to get to the truth. And the reason I want to do this story is because, um, you know, all of this uh, uh, all this commotion about Pizzagate, uh, what really is going on is that whether it's a diversion or not, that's not the the major problem there. The major problem is a pedophile ring that is worldwide that uh, includes high-level Vatican officials, to name a few, uh, high-level priests, cardinals, also high-level people in Washington, and major other major capitals of the world. That's just a beginning. And to go back, I did a story with Jim. I used to interview him back around 2008, 2009. I think it'd be interesting. But before I do that, let me give you my Jesuit quote of the day. And I've got a few of them for you today. And I might preface that by saying yesterday I went out and I asked about three or four people at random, uh, do you know who the Jesuits are? And not one did. One said, oh, I think they're Jesus people. Another one said, aren't they a political organization? Well, they were getting closer. And two others just said, I have no idea. So their propaganda is working well because they don't like people to know who they really are. But this quote, we're going to give you a couple quotes today. And this one is from J.E.C. Shepard. He's a Canadian historian. And he put it well when he said, between 1555 and 1931, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, uh, was expelled from at least 83 countries, city-states, and cities for engaging in political intrigue and subversive plots against the welfare of the state, according to the records of a Jesuit priest of repute. Practically every instance of expulsion was for the political intrigue, political infiltration, political subversion, and inciting to political insurrection. So, I guess they've changed since 1931, but I doubt it. That's just one quote. Let me give you another one. Okay, this one's from a Jesuit general. That's the head of the Society of Jesus. And they call him in Rome, uh, I I learned they called him Papa Nero, which is Black Pope. And uh, this guy, back in the 1700s, he lived from 1706, or he was the Jesuit general from 1706 to 1730. You see, they said the truth back then because there wasn't the internet. People didn't get it all over the world, so how many people really heard it? And uh, the Jesuit general today would never say anything like this. But it's the same. He said this. This is Michelangelo Tamborini, 14th Jesuit Superior General. Said, see, sir, from this chamber, I govern not only Paris, but to China, 
not only China, but to the world without anyone knowing how I do it. Okay, and that's basically uh, what they do here. They basically control our government, and they control many governments of the world, without anybody knowing how they do it. They're based in Georgetown University. That's just right next to the White House. Very convenient. But talking about China, people say, well, how can they? The Jesuits are all over the world. And not all, not to mention the Vatican's uh, concordance with over 200 countries uh, puts them in, in charge, I believe. Now, here's what a uh, someone from China said recently about the Jesuits. His name is Hu Xi. Uh, after learning the language and culture of the Chinese people, these Jesuits began to establish contacts with the young intellectuals of the country. So you see how they operate. They, they, they've been here since the formation of our country. And if you really do some history lessons with me right now for a moment, you would find out that if you really dig deep, that probably one of the Jesuit generals was, should be called one of our founding fathers, a, i.e. Lorenzo Ricci. And uh, I believe the Jesuits had a hand in the formation of this country for a reason. I believe they had a hand in orchestrating the uh, Revolutionary War. And all of this is left out of the history books because that quote about not knowing how to do it is, is, is n not knowing who they are. Remember that one I just read you? We control everything. They have to have help. Help in America is our politicians and our uh, crooked media who cover up for them. That's why no one knows about it. That's why those four or five people I talked to yesterday didn't have any idea. And if I start talking like this, you realize how many people consider you crazy when you say these things? Oh, they're good educators. You know, I've met people that told me that whole story. And uh, why don't we do this, though? Why don't we look at what Pope Francis said about the Jesuits? Now, he's a Jesuit, first Jesuit pope ever. Listen to what he says. It's quite interesting. This will be my last quote of the day. The Jesuits have a vow to obey the pope. But if the pope is a Jesuit, maybe he should have a vow to obey the superior general. I feel like I'm still a Jesuit in terms of my spirituality, and that's what I have in my heart. Wow, that kind of explains it all, doesn't it? Uh, this black and white, the black pope, the white pope, this black and white yin-yang uh, idea, uh, what's black is white, what's white is black. Eh, boy, the, the lines are getting blurred very quickly here and when you start really looking at what this Pope has said about Christianity basically the Bible he's minimized Jesus the Bible he's together with all these religions creating the one world religion which they have to do in order to have political control of the world and the only question is when and how and they're moving right along as we speak Okay, before I get into the uh, story I want to talk about with uh, Jim Rothstein, the New York police detective, who basically enlightened me about how these pedophile rings operate and why we should, you know, we can look at Pizzagate, but Pizzagate was here to basically bring out, like the fish to, at bait, all these people on the Internet, uh, probably talking a lot about the truth about what these emails from uh, John Podesta and the Clintons were all about, about this pedophile ring there. But it was done for a purpose. That's why Alex Jones got out in front of the story, because he works with them. Now, back when I was doing these interviews with Rothstein and a few others, when I was uh, closer to these people because I worked at those radio stations, they wouldn't touch this story with a 10-foot pole. That's because they were told not to. So now they're told to, and what they're doing is luring people so now they can control the Internet because recently the Pope, he just came out and said, basically, people that we don't want people researching scandals, and these people are basically have this kind of illness, which means they have an attraction to feces. And he says, don't cover these stories. Don't do anything like that. What you have to do is you have to cover uh, good things 
And even if these scandals are true, he says, you shouldn't cover them at all. Wow, isn't that amazing what this guy is talking about? So anyway, I'm going to get into uh, going back to the truth about these. I can't take any calls right now. There we go. But anyway, uh, I want to get back to really uh, stories that have validity, talking to people who actually were investigating this from the side of wanting to figure out where all these kids were going. All these kids on the, you know, you've seen them on the uh, milk cartons. And if you take the anatomy of a, uh, a boy taking off his paper route, the story of what happened to this man, this kid, 10 years old or 11 years old from uh, Des Moines, Iowa, Johnny Gosh, if you follow that story, you will understand how they, they operate and how much control they have over even our local police authorities. So uh, we'll do that in a minute. But here's what I want to do right now. I do want to speak about this petition to free Tony Alamo. And we're going to present this to the pardon attorney when uh, Donald Trump gets into office. And hopefully we're going to uh, get Tony released next year. And if you haven't heard the story, it's quite, it's really, the reason I cover it, because it really talks about persecution in this country of Christianity. And I've made the recent analogy, a very quick one. I said, why do they allow, why does our government allow these militant Muslim groups to operate all over our country? And we documented that. One happens to be in Hancock, New York, called Islamburg. And the FBI actually has photos, and I've seen uh, of pictures. The Clarion Project has photos. They have uh, 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 videos of these people actually marching with weapons, saying, death to America, we're preparing for war. And the question was uh, presented by even a mainstream uh, uh, news uh, commentator, Bill O'Reilly. He asked, are they controlling these people? And the man from the Clarion Project said, well, they're monitoring them, and then Riley shot back and said, that's not control, and he's absolutely right. So then he said, how many, how many, are, how many people are up there in Hancock, New York? And, then, and the man said, well, I'm not, they're not sure, but they have tracked over twenty to 30,000 of these people in different uh, settings like this all over the country, maybe 30 to 40 of these Islambergs. So the federal government is allowing this to continue, but yet they raid... The Tony Alamo ministry, they've been trying to bring them down for 40 years. They come with the guns blazing. Kids were playing on the swing at a peaceful ministry in Falk, Arkansas. And they basically put the pastor in jail for 175 years for crimes he didn't commit. They tried to disrupt the ministry by kidnapping all these children when no child abuse was ever found. And thirdly, they've tried to take away all their property. And one of their properties in Arkansas went into the civil case, of course, and uh, the judge ruled that uh, in, he gave a judgment of over $500 million, the largest civil judgment in Arkansas state history, but yet we allow these militant Muslim groups to operate. Think about that. Now, just really quickly, let me explain. Tony Alamono's Christian ministry have been targeted for more than 40 years by U.S. government agencies, including but not limited to the FBI, BATF, CIA, IRS, you name it, they did it. FBI informants have come forward with sworn testimony they were hired to frame Pastor Alamo for his biblical and political views. The sworn testimony was not allowed in his 2008 criminal trial for violations of the Mann Act, in which close examination of trial and appeal documents indicate a miscarriage of justice of the worst degree. Uh, folks, Think about this. We have men who were hired to frame him. They couldn't testify at trial. And if the, if the jury would have heard that, of course he wouldn't be in prison. Now also, interesting enough, when the jury went out to deliberate, they came back, they were confused, and they asked the judge regarding his ju uh, instructions that he gives the jury. They came back with the most... When you hear this, you're going to just flip out. If you really want to have justice in this country, listen to what's going on in this, what was worse than a kangaroo court. He says, the, 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 uh, one of the jury, the jury foreman comes out and says, uh, Your Honor, if he didn't commit any sexual crimes, can we still convict him? 
And the judge, instead of saying, well, no, of course not, you can't, he says, well, just read my instructions. He, he did not want to answer that question. So <laughs> let me tell you something. That is, the mo- that is, that is uh, in the court records, and it's, it's just totally amazing to me. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is to uh, see if we can present all this stuff in a writ, a very uh, uh, detailed document, along with this petition, which you can go to. If you go to freetonyalamo.com, you can, uh, up at the top, you'll see petition. Hit that. Uh, click on that, and it'll take you to the petition site where you can sign up. You can put your name down. Uh, you can act- actually have your name behind the scenes, and it'll still appear as one of the people that are signing. So if you're shy about giving your name out, you can still do this. Uh, and please help us do it. So uh, what I wanted to do right now was to go to one of the most recent comments from a man by the name of, uh, he was not afraid to put his name down, and uh, congratulations. you got to stand for something in this world. Louis P. Solari from New Jersey signed Tony's petition, and he said this, I had the good Lord's blessing and fortune to be a member of the Tony Alamo Christian Ministries from 2004 to 2011. I served the Lord at four churches of the Tony Alamo Christian Ministries in Los Angeles, Fork, Arkansas, Fort Smith, and New Jersey. The reason for my leaving was in no way, shape, or form related to Pastor Alamo's actions, which led to his false imprisonment. The reason I left the ministry was that I had been recently married, and my wife could not uh, stand to be, not to be close to her son, uh, and he was living uh, away from where the ministry was. Her son had Down syndrome, and he passed away two years ago at the age of 19. I never got a chance to tell Pastor Alamo thank you for drawing me near to, to Jesus. Tony was not only my pastor, but my teacher, my mentor, and the best friend a man could ever have. The injustice of his prison sentence is appalling but was based upon false accusations, made-up stories, and the motive, if revenge. Uh, Tony taught me the ways of the Lord, who I follow still to this day, believe and trust in the Lord. By imprisoning Tony just means he is limited to uh, what he can personally, so he he can personally witness to the Lord. Uh, Word shall never, uh, all the glory needs to go to God, Louis P. Solari. Now that's that's a good comment. And uh, before I leave, uh, uh, I'm going to finish up this uh, half hour with a couple uh, things about this this case. Uh, go to that site, and you can read many, many uh, quotes coming from all over the world. And I find it interesting. And maybe I'll just stick with that for a minute. If we, uh, I can pick out a couple here, maybe from outside the country. Some of them are hard to read. People have, you know, English is not their first language. Um, Here's one from New Hampshire. Interesting. I am not a Protestant, but I feel it is a travesty that an 82-year-old Christian preacher is in jail on false charges by the government while illegal aliens get a free pass for actual crimes. President Trump, please pardon Pastor Alamo. And if I could add something... Uh, just recently, you're going to find, you know, how many people, did we, there was a case right now where a illegal alien was deported eight times in our country, but allowed to, it snuck back eight times. And finally, just the other day, he hit two young, uh, young girls, killed them, and is on the run. He should have never been here. The laws are protecting the criminals that Obama and these and all of our presidents in the past, since this this migration problem has has surfaced, allowed to stay here. So they protect these criminals. Not to mention, even in my little uh, what I wrote to, on the beginning of the petition, I remember way back when Bill Clinton left office, and I'm, I want to see who Obama pardons on the last minute. That's always a criminal. Uh, but remember when Clinton left office? He, on the last day, pardoned Mark Rich, who was one on the FBI 10 most wanted list. Now, if that doesn't tell you what's going on, nothing will. Uh, 
Here's one, uh, Conrad A. from Nigeria. He's being held simply for the expose on the Pope's secrets that he wrote and other revealing articles. All right, yeah, we've read the Pope's secret on here and recently read another article that Tony just wrote from prison uh, regarding uh, Bill Clinton and how Bill Clinton uh, was behind, you know, making sure that this ministry uh, was taken off the face of the earth. But it isn't. It's still running fine. And they get over three to 400,000 hits every, uh, every week still. So, you know, this message is still getting out all over the world. They send much literature to Nigeria. And just to speak about Nigeria, remember I just had John Levy, uh, international attorney, on my show last week. And John was talking. He represents a lot of the, some of these freedom-fighting groups in Africa, uh, in the Cameroons and several, uh, several other places. And he talks about personal uh, knowledge of what's really going on over there. And we don't hear it on the news. We have over 70 million Christians surrounded by Muslims. We don't see one Christian being brought over here. They can't even get to the refugee camps because they'll be afraid they get killed, so they're left out to dry. And there's a genocide going on. And the reason is the Pope wants to get rid, and our government, of all Christians on the face of the earth, along with the Jews, so they can create this one world order and one world government, which will be a hell of a place to live. I might as well be in hell. Uh, and I don't want to go down with them. And I hope you don't either. Uh, so take a look at that. I mean, it's incredible. And uh, I get people emailing me from these countries. So I got to know some of these people. And they're telling me, man, their life is, they're, they're running for their lives. And, and you think you hear anything from the United Nations about that? No, they're more worried about bringing over all these people that we created this crazy story in Syria and Libya through the Clinton, you know, when she was Secretary of State, destabilizing all these countries so they could flood Europe and America with all these Syrian and Muslim refugees who many don't want to assimilate in the countries they're, they're left in. And you talk to people in France, and you talk to people in England, you talk to people in Spain, you talk to people in Italy. And then you go, I mentioned, I wanted to talk about Dearborn, uh, Dearborn, Michigan. And maybe I'll do that in the beginning of next half hour and uh, it's an incredible story. I forgot I mentioned that yesterday. And then I'll see if I have time to get to uh, Jim Rothstein and uh, this huge pedophile problem in our country. And if we can't get it all today, I can do it. You know, we have another day's tomorrow. We can do it tomorrow. So let me look at uh, maybe find here another quote from one of the people that signed the petition. And I'll just pick something out at random. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, here's one. Let's see. Uh, this one here. Tony Alamo, and this is from Joshua H., is a good man and has helped so many people. His ministry is his family, and he cares so deeply for strangers and those without hope. He does exactly what a Christian is supposed to do. He has taught me so much, and I will continue to pray for this man suffering this great persecution. That's Joshua from Ohio. Uh, let's see, I'll just pick one out. Um, Jonathan from Florida. Uh, this is a man of God, and I dare anyone to read his literature, listen to his messages, and compare it with the Bible, and find something contrary. You won't, just as the high priest in the days of Jesus could not fault his, his teachings, you will also not be able to find much heresy or any heresy in his words. The Bible says it's hard for you to kick against... Uh, against the pigs. So if you want to stop kicking the thorn bushes, in the other words, if you want to stop fighting against God and God's people, you will stand up for those who are being wrongfully persecuted and release Tony Alamo. Uh, do I have time here for one more? No. Take a break. Back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. 
So without your help, these programs cannot continue on internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator for his holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. The book of Revelation says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Since the beginning of time, Kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Okay, welcome back to the second half hour of the Investigative Journal on this December 13th, 2016 day on our calendar. I'm your host, Greg Anthony. This is FirstAmendmentRadio.com. And yesterday I, I said I'd get to this story about what's happening in Dearborn, Michigan. And it relates to everything we're talking about here, this Muslim infiltration that seems to be not to assimilate into our country, but to bring about Sharia law and really a changeover of Western civilization. Now, people might say, Greg, that's an exaggeration. But hear me out for a minute. Now, the reason I want to... Someone, a good friend of mine from Italy sent me this story, who lives in New Jersey, by the way. He's an American. And he was concerned about it. And he knew that I had worked as a journalist in Michigan and in Detroit. And I knew Dearborn well. And when I was there back in, uh, it was in the late 70s, early, mid yeah, mid-70s, you go to Dearborn and it was called German Heights. It was a complete European, I mean, American city, settled mostly by Germans who assimilated into our country. But because of the economic depression that was brought about in Detroit, in that area there, in fact, Dearborn was... Uh, the first place that, excuse me, the uh, uh, Henry Ford, he started the newspaper there called the Dearborn Independent. So there are a lot of auto workers there. And when that industry dried up and our, you know, our powers that be sent all of these jobs and these factories overseas, Dearborn was in bad shape. 
And what's happened to it now is a clear example of what I talked about yesterday. We talked, and let's, let's do this real quickly. We looked at the Tony Alamo ministry and, and other Christian ministries and show how they have been persecuted. Then we looked at how our government allows radical Muslim groups to exist, even buying them land. And I'm sure they got them the weapons. And they're in these little places, these uh, 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 compounds, 60 to 70 acre compound, one in, in upstate New York. And they're allowed to carry weapons to, to basically say openly, death to America, and and then they just monitor that. They don't go in and, and shut them down. Then secondly, we have uh, Fatullah Gulen and the Gulen movement here, which is basically, you know, they say they're a moderate group, but as research will show you, what they've done in Europe over the years is they're a moderate, they're, they, they're moderate on the outside, but inside they're a radical Muslim group who deals with the intellectual side of this whole story. And they're allowed in this country through the Clintons. This man, we know Fatullah Gulen, he's, he's wanted by Erdogan from Turkey for being involved with the CIA and him in creating that coup that almost killed Erdogan, which they wanted. They screwed it up. So now they're dealing with the aftermath. And the media has been really quick to say that Erdogan is the radical and Fatula Gulen's a moderate, and uh, all Erdogan said was, listen, we need to have him sent back because he's caused much damage here. And our American government's protecting him. He lives in a mansion in the Pocono, or in, um, yeah, the Pocono Mountains, and he runs an organization worldwide. And here he gets over $150 million to create charter schools that deep down inside are teaching radical Islam and Sharia law, but that's okay. While the while the while the Democrats and the, the leaders of their party don't allow our you know free schooling, our school choice in our inner cities, so they're allowing radical Muslims to have charter schools. But then again, in our inner cities, they're not allowing school choice. So it doesn't make sense. Well, it does to me. They want to bring the overthrow of this country, and they want to create a uh, a new world order without Western civilization getting in the way. And we're one of the last huge countries they have to destroy. And Dearborn, Michigan is a good example. And so my friend sends this to me. And he said, I'd seen this uh, short clip, this interview on television from Newsmax, which uh, talks about what happened in Dearborn. And he says, what's interesting, it shows how everything can be turned upside down for the benefit of the empire, he says. And the empire, we know what the empire is. We might as well call it the Roman Empire. The most important line in this film, he says, is when the host driver, Mr. Uh, it's Dennis Lynch, uh, shows how these Muslims move in. The landlords raise the rents on the original business owners, the European business owners, and the Muslims then buy it up, probably with government money, and move in and control, uh, take over. What is disturbing is that they take over properties, yet they receive all these state benefits as well. Housing, they're buying up the home, they're giving money to buy up all the neighborhood homes that were left vacant. Now, he says someone in high finance behind the scenes is behind all this. The other depressing fact, he said, is the ward of Dearborn is called German Heights, but there's nothing left that makes it look European at all. So, my question to you is, if I took a group of Christians to a Muslim country, like Saudi Arabia, who basically donated a lot of money to the Clinton Foundation and the Clinton campaign. But if we took, let's say, a group of 300 Christians to a little suburb of Saudi Arabia, and we decided to set up a church along with all of our shops where we want to eat our food. I want to eat Italian spaghetti. I want to have a spaghetti shop. I want to have American shops there. I want an American movie theater. You know what would happen? We'd all be thrown out of the country or killed or put in jail. But they're allowed to come over here and take over a city and then not even try to assimilate. 
everything's written in Arabic. They don't speak English. And when you hear this five-minute clip, you're going to be shocked because this is the three-prong approach they have. One, create ISIS, the militant group that's going around killing people and cutting Christians' heads off. Secondly, create Fatullah Gulen and the intellectual Muslim movement, masquerading as moderates, when in fact, radical Islam and the Sharia law is their goal. And you'll see when you read that book by Mr. Hammond I've referred to called Slavery, Etc., and Jihad, uh, the more it, the, the takeover country depends on the amount of people amount of Muslims in the country, and if it gets to a percentage of like in, the, in those countries, Middle East, you have no freedoms whatsoever. It's Sharia law or nothing. And they even go about killing the more moderate Muslims. That's what you see in the Sunnis and the Shiites. So, Dearborn is a microcosm. They've done it in a small town, but this is what they want to do in the whole country, so we better watch it. I would not at all feel like I'm not an American citizen or I don't love freedom by kicking them all out. Saying, hey, if you come here, you better, you know, you're here to be in America, not to create Sharia law and bring your country here when I can't even go to your country. It doesn't seem like it's a two-way street to me. And we're supposed to be tolerant while they're going to shove a knife in your back in the end? No way. Now, remember, you know, then these liberals, you know, all these liberals will come down on me if I say that and say, well, you, look at your, you're a racist. You don't like Muslims. Well, the point is, think about all, we're an immigrant country, right? All of our forefathers, many of our four European forefathers came here. Italians, uh, Polish, Irish, German. But they weren't given benefits they had to work. The government, you know, they they allowed them in, but you you know, they made it on their with their own two hands, and they assimilated. They learned English. They believed in the flag. They believed in the American way of life. And they wanted to do, you know, they didn't come here and create Italy in Italy. Oh, sure, they the Italians live in the Italian neighborhood, but they assimilated. Polish lived in the Polish neighborhood, but they assimilated. They didn't come here to create their own country here. They came here to learn English, to have a new way of life. These people aren't coming here for that reason. And I'm seeing more even in San Diego as I speak, walking through the park the other day. You know, I'm seeing more burkas. And I'm saying it's 80 degrees out. What are you wearing that heavy clothing for? If I said that, they'd call me a racist. And they don't say hi. I walk by about 20 or 30 of these people. And, you know... And I have a really nice looking dog. They don't even they don't even ex think I exist. They just walk by me with this smug attitude. And not to say that some of these people I don't know. I'm not I'm not generalizing. But all of this is is coming to a head. And you can thank the Vatican and you can thank the immigration policies of all these countries. And look at Europe and Merkel and uh, France and what's going on in Italy and what's going on here. And now they're going to bring in thousands more and what about this uh, Australian problem we're, we're asked to take over 2,000 I think it's Somalians from Australia who has a very Australia has a tough immigration plan they got as much land mass as us why do we have to take them well anyway let me get to this short five-minute clip about Dearborn I may add some things because there's some, when they, they do this, they're taking a, a view of what Dearborn, Michigan is right now as a man drives in his car and he's looking at all these shops and there's a little bit of music going on. So I'll talk over that, try to show you, you know, in your mind's eye what he's looking at. And it's shocking to me because I remember Dearborn and I never saw any of these shops when I was there. It was a European town where it was supposed to be, where you could, you know, uh, <laughs> could actually speak English. Okay, here we go. This is a five-minute clip about Dearborn, Michigan, and how it's changed. And uh, I think you'll be shocked when you hear this. Most people don't even know this. You go into places like Dearborn, Michigan, you don't feel like you're in America anymore. So 
now I'm looking at Beirut by night, American and, and, and right Middle now East we're cuisine. Towards, uh, the east side of Dearborn. You'll see the, uh, the culture shift where you won't feel that you're uh, in the United States any longer. How long have you lived in Dearborn? Uh, all my life. Okay, now I'm looking at all the shops. I can't read them. They're all uh, in Arabic. There's the mosque, big mosque. I don't see any Christian churches. Here's another restaurant, the Arabian Village, Yemen Community Center. And every one of these shops, it's, all the shops I remember that were American or German are now Abu Kabab, Islamic Institute of Knowledge. Wow. Seriously, what happened to all the American businesses right here? They come in by the strip mall. They uh, move the uh, previous owners out. They uh, increase the rent dramatically. So the force, they force, force them out. People, they force people out. And then they put similar similar businesses, but with a Arabic, Arabic tone. Yes. Okay, now I'm looking at a restaurant filled with uh, burkas. You think a lot of people here voted for Obama? Of course they did. Yeah. Why, why, why? Why do you think they voted for Obama? The um, tenements, all the uh, health care. Uh, some of these guys come in and have up to four wives. When they file for the um, rich cards, EBT cards, they are bringing the other three as extended family members. When we're going grocery shopping, you see these uh, young Arab ladies, girls, um, with their kids getting on Range Rovers, using their uh, EBT bridge cards to pay for the groceries. I'm actually in the medical equipment business, so sometimes when they come in my office, uh, they're in designer clothes, carrying product purses, pulling out their uh, Medicaid cards for their uh, health care. And knowing the addresses and knowing uh, where they live, I don't understand how they're getting uh, Welfare assistance driving uh, $60,000, $70,000 vehicles and living in $250,000, homes. So you're seeing what's happened. Our government is supporting this. Immigrants from the Middle East represent the fastest growing immigrant demographic in the United States. And over the past three years, the Obama administration has taken in more immigrants from the Middle East than Mexico and Central America combined. And it's about to get worse. Seven million Syrians have applied to come here to the United States as refugees. Imagine the strain on the welfare system. Today, 36% of Americans claim to earn less than $30,000 per year. But in the Muslim community, it's up to 45%. Five or six years ago, was it anything close to where it is right now? No, absolutely not. It's, the population has probably uh, doubled in this area, uh, in Jibbon Heights, as far as the uh, Middle East are. Over the last five, six years. Five, six years. See uh, more radicalization. Yeah. Uh, Arabs moving in. Excuse me. Excuse me. Like they're coming here, but they want. They don't want to mix in with Americans. Right. They're not mixing in. Yeah. They're um, not learning the language. Reuter Street. Do you know where Reuter Street is? You don't know where Reuter Street is? Thank you. They're not really uh, becoming Americanized. In the high school where you have a large Muslim population, they have to serve halal food. The uh, non-Muslim, it's actually two menus, uh, one for the non-Muslims and one for the Muslims. So now, what's the impact on that? Is that? That's an increased cost to the uh, school systems. Do you never see American flags? Never. Never. Why is it that the Muslim community is not blending in with the rest of American society? Because this is what they are being told in mosques across the United States, Dennis. And part of what they're teaching them in the mosque is do not assimilate with the Americans. They are your enemies. One of the things that bothered me is that as I traveled through one street after the next, and I'm talking about many streets, I did not see homes with an American flag waving outside. Is there any chance we have that Muslims will, will turn around and start to blend in? No, there is no chance. We are seeing a reverse, actually, instead of them blending in, instead of assimilation.
if you were to take somebody, like an old neighbor who used to live in Dearborn, but moved away, and you were to drop them back into Dearborn, would they know where they were? Not really. It's, 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 it's completely uh, remade. Yeah. All right. So, what, what do you think the deal with that is? The flag? Yeah. They've been here a long time. That's a statement, too. That flag's making a statement? Yeah. What, what, what is the statement? That, uh, that's an American. Yeah. This is, uh, this is, this this is, is America. American. Wow. What a story. And I tell you, the last sentence was, "Is it's America. Well, it's not America in Dearborn. And like I said, that's a microcosm of what they're planning to do in this entire country. In fact, what they want to do in the entire world. And they're getting the backing by Barack Hussein Obama, who's a Muslim. Probably wasn't even born in this country. Now, I was going to get into my interview about the pedophilia rings in this country with a New York police detective. But I'm going to do that tomorrow because I went overboard on this story. I only have six minutes, so I thought I'd emphasize this. If you don't believe me, look at the statistics, and I'm going to refer you to a book you have to read, or just read excerpts of it. Uh, It's by Dr. Peter Hammond. It's called Slavery, Terrorism, and Islam. And uh, like I've said before, and I think it should be emphasized here, he documents the way Muslims slowly develop a presence in various countries, and as their population numbers build, become more aggressive and assertive about exercising Sharia law. Now, if you just look at the picture that I've presented to you regarding the militant groups functioning in Hancock, New York, and all over the country, about Fethullah Gulen's uh, movement, intellectual movement, which is basically hiding behind moderate uh, Muslims when really they're talking about Sharia law, then you're looking at uh, how Christians and the Tony Alamo ministry have been persecuted in this country, how God's being taken out of the schools, but yet when these Muslims come to our schools, we're giving them basically a new menu. Now tell me our four, our, our ancestors had that. When we came here, they didn't get a special Italian menu or a German menu or what have you. Now, it's pretty obvious, the keys, these people, when you were looking at this, they're living in these rich houses, they're driving expensive cars, but yet they're getting money from the federal government for Medicaid, and they have an EBT card where they're getting food and everything, and it seems like they're being treated better than our own people, as well as better than our veterans. We know the story about veterans who wait in lines to get to the VA, and there's there's eight to ten suicides daily. It's crazy. But here's what Dr. Hammond said, just to emphasize: Islam, folks, is not a religion, nor is it a really a cult. It's a in its fullest form, it's a complete, total, 100% system of life. That's why they do not want to assimilate. In fact, they want as their numbers grow. They want to force Sharia law on everybody. Islam has a religious, legal, political, economic, social, and military components. The religious component is the covering of all the other components. And what he says is so interesting here, and I'm going to read it to you, uh, about his book. Uh, Their takeover of a country, what Hammonds refers to as Islamization, begins when the population of Muslims reaches a critical mass, and they begin to agitate for various privileges. Open free democratic societies are particularly vulnerable because we let people in. When politically, we can't do this in their country. When politically correct, tolerant, and culturally diverse societies agree to Muslim demands for their religious privileges, as some of the other components tend to creep in as well. And let me tell you this. What I'm saying is if we go over there, we're either put in jail or killed. But they come here and they, they think they can, you know, we give them these special privileges. I don't think they should get one privilege. I don't even think we should allow them into the country the way things are today. It's a big world. 
And to see what happened to Dearborn, Michigan, is a microcosm of what they plan in the rest of the world, in the rest of our country. And if you don't believe me, all you got to do is look at the statistics. And Hammond's book talks about it. And he says basically this, and you can go to that book and get I've read the statistics before. He says, uh, this is how it works. When the Muslim population remains small, they act as if they're primarily peace-loving. But as it grows, they grow more militant. And basically, their goal is to not assimilate in America, not assimilate in England, not assimilate in France or Italy, but to slowly, as their numbers grow, take over. And you've got to go look at those statistics. I'm not going to go through each one of them as far as the statistics of the amount of Muslims in a country and what the country turns into. Now, when we came here, when our, fourth, when our grandparents and great-grandparents came here, they assimilated. Sure, nothing was perfect, but it wasn't our, their goal wasn't to create a new law, new, create a new constitution, wasn't to create, get government subsidies, wasn't given, they weren't given homes, businesses, and to work for them. And I swear, if these people did, they wouldn't be here. And if they did, they'd probably have to assimilate. But now, the governments, with the Vatican backing, are allowing these people to come into a place like Dearborn, given every possible hand out, and look what it turned into. Just go to that. Uh, you can go and uh, uh, you got You got to. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to give you a, uh, the exact uh, link to go to this story. So come back tomorrow. You can watch this five minute clip, but maybe you can find it if you Google it. Uh, Dearborn, Michigan, uh, takeover by Muslims. Something like that. But anyway, I uh, hope you get my point. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about uh, the interview I did in 2009 with Jim Rostein, Rostein, that police detective. And we'll get back tomorrow. So have a good evening and see you tomorrow on The Investigative Journal. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the rapture will be canceled. That's crossthebordertheborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C R O S S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book. The rapture will be canceled. That's crossthebordered.org.